So I'm writing a novel is the show where you join me, Oliver Brackenbury, on the journey of writing my next novel, from first ideas all the way to publication and promotion. In this one-man reality show, I'll share with you my ever-evolving thoughts and feelings on how I write, being a writer, and everything that entails at each stage of the process. I'll also answer listener questions and, sometimes, interview people who write fiction. If you're the kind of person who likes to learn how things are made and get to know the people making them, then this is the show for you. Last time, I talked about the carrier bag theory of fiction and how it basically has helped me form the big idea for the ending of the book, even if I don't know what like the actual like events, the moments, the moments of it are, and I only have a vague idea of the story, you know, Vogue getting dumped on the front door of the wizard to deal with him, but she's a different person than the one who vowed to kill him way back when she was 19. And I think that, on top of the previous five episodes, makes a pretty good first chunk of this podcast, a pretty first good section in the story of figuring out the story of the novel. What's a word for that? A section of a story? A chorpter? A chipter? Um, a chiropractor? I feel like the first six episodes of this make a pretty good first chiropractor for the podcast, So I'm Writing a Novel. And now... You'd think I would have done this for the first episode, but it was a lot to cram in, and I realized it was really its own thing. Now, I'm going to read to you the short story, Vo, the 10th and current draft as of this recording. Almost certainly not the final draft. Oh boy, no way in heck. Uh, it's going to definitely change once I've written the rest of the novel and come back to it. But this is how it is and how it's going to be probably for some time. I'll save my commentary behind the scenes stuff for after I've read it. Except to say that I haven't read this in probably three or four months, I think, since I thought of something where, that I twiddled to make it, you know, the tenth draft. And that I'll be reading this from a hard copy printout, so you're going to hear pages flopping and flipping occasionally. My apologies in advance if hearing that sound is your own personalized brown note. Okay, <laughs> let's do this. Vo by Oliver Brackenbury, tenth draft. Flat on his back in a field, the warm rain slid over Krog's split lips and swirled the taste of rust into his half-open mouth. A fellow shepherd screamed over him as he reached for a rock to bash in Krog's head. Wasn't there a bird so dim it would stare up at rain, open-mouthed until it drowned? Maybe they weren't dim. Maybe they didn't care if they lived or died. Hearing the thud of a heavy boot, Krog turned away from the rain and saw someone coming to intervene. Oh there, stay your hand, she called out. His attacker wobbled with the effort. Who are you to tell me so? A queen? She drew a warhammer. My scepter. Why does a stranger like you care? She continued her advance in silence. Krog's attacker cast the stone aside with a curse, choosing then to see if he could send a glob of spit right through Krog's forehead. Krog wiped it away, dragging the glob back into his flaxen hair. I'll mark! The shepherd cried over his shoulder at Krog, then stomped away. The woman looked confused by the word. Where did she come from? Slinging her hammer over her back, she finished her approach. Krog dared to fully open his blackened eyes. A hand blocked the sun, one so strong and worn it couldn't belong to the woman whose voice he'd heard. But it did. I'm Starla. A name from no language he recognized, spoken in an accent of neither his village nor the other, the soulless one. She offered him her hand. He accepted, then was hoisted so fast he felt dizzy. What does uh, Almark mean? she asked. Krog knew it meant an animal that could not be stopped from trespassing on cropland, like a sheep jumping over dikes or breaking through fences so it can eat the products of a farmer's labor. Someone who diddles his own kin, he muttered. What kind of name is Starla? The giantess shook aside a lock of her rust-colored hair and laughed. It's the name of a reaver, a seeker, and a warrior the name of someone from lands well beyond this island. Krog held his tongue. Her hammer's steel head must have weighed at least as much as the one on his shoulders. The spiked side was modeled after a raven's beak, the blunt side engraved with an unpleasant rendition of a boar's features, which Starla had no doubt stamped into the flesh of many an enemy. Krog backed away a few paces. Do you know this island well? she asked. Aye, this half. This half is what interests me, she said. Be my guide. I'll protect you. And, if I find what I'm after, you'll get this. Starla showed him a gold coin like you'd show a beaten dog a treat. He stared at it a moment. I've never seen markings like that on a coin. 
You've never been to the scorching desert where sits Egbar, the city of a thousand merchants. But no matter, it's gold and you can melt it down if the markings so concern you. He shrugged. I need a moment to think. If Starla tried to hide her annoyance at this, her face betrayed her. Most folk he knew never did business with coin, only barter. How could he spend such a ridiculous thing? It was more likely to get him robbed, then beaten again, even killed. Then again, at least one of his fellows wanted to kill him. Anyway, he'd also enjoy a break from minding sheep, even if he had to set aside his distaste for other people. I'll guide you, he told the broad-shouldered idiot. But please, keep your coin. She grinned, then told him where she wanted to be taken. I need a moment to think, Krog repeated. He watched her out of the corner of his eye. It was plain she was anxious to move, almost as if the low, rolling hills surrounding the valley were a mob closing in on her. We'll go this way, he said. Mind the dottle. Her smile returned as they moved. What's dottle? Starla sank her boot in the wet, brown answer a sheep had left behind. Krog knew his flock of fluffy white fools would wait for him. They liked to stay to the field they knew. He paid attention to his guardian instead. It wasn't difficult. Though he was the guide, she kept striding ahead of him, falling behind again when he needed to make a decision about which way to turn. We'll go left, he swung his head. No need to tackle that Bjerg. What's a Bjerg look like? Starla didn't wait for an answer. I swear, I'll slay the beast. It means a rocky hill. <laughs> Krog held back a smirk. In this case, one we don't have to climb if we take the leftward path. Who was this big buffoon? No stranger had come to the isle since the old kings. Finding little worth ruling or tithing, they'd stayed a short while before washing back down south from whence they came, leaving a smattering of human flotsam behind to found the two villages. As with the hammer, the black links of her chain shirt were well crafted. He didn't know enough of smithing to learn anything more. He did know a thing or two about wool. You'd have to boil chamomile leaves mixed with just the right amount of grass to get the rich, mossy green of the vest worn under her mail. Though her breeches were as dull a russet as any pair you'd see worn on the aisle, the ground lapis required to dye her cloak its rich shade of duck blue would be scarce. In his village, only the priest could afford such a color. With a coin of gold in her pocket, he guessed she could too. Krog closed his eyes for a moment. A cool breeze soothed the bloody bruise on his cheek. Why are you closing your eyes? Starla demanded. Taking a moment to think, he said. When he opened them again, Krog smiled at the impatience that vibrated out from Starla. He'd barely finished gesturing, and she'd already started in the direction he pointed. Starla slid down a deep, slippery rock face, washed clean by yesterday's rain. Krog identified it for her as a screwid. Then followed on the footholds she missed. Screwid. Starla over-enunciated, picking herself up. She narrowed her eyes at her guide, who wondered what made Starla so trusting. Why did that man want to beat your head in? Oh, it's a dry tale of the kind of resentments and misunderstandings that add a little spice to life in small villages. Krog went on and made it clear in the telling that he was not to blame for anything. This only seemed to make Starla watch him closer still. It wasn't until a passing storm petrol drew her attention that Krog relaxed his shoulders. They left the rocky hills behind them for softer, more even fields. Krog saw the tower of freckled muscles reach for her hammer again. This time it struck him as wise. Perhaps she did have a warrior's instincts. Did you know of this part of the island? he asked. No, she replied. The old wizard didn't mention it. Old wizard? Krog decided to ignore that. He knew nothing of wizards, so he changed the subject to what he did know. Now, we're walking along the borderland, separating the island's two halves. If a member of the other village were to cross it, then of course they'd have to be killed. Man, woman, or child, it doesn't matter because they aren't really human. Oh, they look as such, but those from the other village have no souls in them. Starla's round features hardened at this. Perhaps the killing feeling rose in her at the mention of such abominations? Krog allowed himself to feel a bit of kinship with the reader, the seeker, the warrior. Will we need to cross this boundary? she asked. No, no, no. I would never take us across it, even with you at my side, he answered. You'd crush a few skulls, I'm sure, but eventually their spearheads would get cozy in your guts. Krog explained how moving along the boundary was the quickest way to where they were headed. Starla let him lead. She scrutinized the uneven line of hedge and broken stone dividing the island. 
After so many centuries, all the best raiding paths are well known and well guarded. Don't worry, none of them are on our route, he continued. I'll worry as I please, she replied. The big important warrior didn't even look at him. At the time she'd saved Krog, the sun had just appeared. Now it was about to reach its highest point in the sky. Starla didn't take her hand from her hammer until they could taste the sea again. Soon afterward, Krog stopped. They had arrived. Starla gawked like a child at the seaside ruins. The main structure was the foundation and most of the walls of a wheelhouse, rooms spiraling off from a center chamber, all of it weathered by centuries without a roof. A few scatterings of stone suggested a fort or tower of some sort had once stood on this steep cliff, keeping watch across the water. There wasn't much of substance left. I've hid here many times, Krog confessed, when the people of my village found reason to want to harm me. Hid and stared at a sea I envy you for having crossed. Starla ignored him. Krog watched the big oaf pondering over the ruins as if trying to remember something. What was it she sought here? Krog wondered if it was in the wheelhouse, among the nubs of long-gone fortifications, where her gaze kept returning to. A sharp wind blew, and when Starla brushed her red ringlets from her face, she went still, then moved so fast, there was no time to ask the brute what she'd seen. Krog had never had his shoulder crushed in a vice, but as Starla dragged him down to crouch among the ruins of the wheelhouse, he figured he got the gist. He held still and listened. When he heard their voices, he realized what was afoot. Their accents made it clear they were from the other village. I don't understand, Krog whispered. Why would they come this way? It's always been known this is one of the worst raiding paths. It's so far from here to our village and so exposed. So terrible a path no sentries bother to watch it, eh, Shepard? Starla whispered back, one eyebrow raised. Now... For the sake of whatever you find holy, be quiet. Every time he tried to steal a peek at the raiders, Starla would press on his shoulder, forcing him to sit back against a waist-high wall. Starla struggled to keep herself hidden, and for once, Krog didn't mind her being so much larger. Better they spot her than him. Krog closed his eyes and focused on the raiders' conversation. It was mostly idle chatter about the stupid things those from the other village concerned themselves with. Such half-hearted impersonations of actual people. Still, it was strange to hear one of them express concern for someone else. They came close, and Krog realized they were on some kind of rescue mission. Then all he could hear was Starla, breathing like bellows. Sure, the raiders were near, yet it seemed they would pass them by. Why was she so agitated? Starla shoved off his shoulder with a great force. Krog opened his eyes to see her, hammer in hand vault across the wall they'd been hiding behind. A blonde with broadsword, a redhead with spear, and a short-haired woman with a longbow. They all turned at Starla's war cry. Only the woman kept her cool. Starla went for her first. Starla sidestepped a freshly knocked arrow and seized at the woman's wrist. The blue-cloaked battler dragged the archer to a half-toppled column of stones, keeping the archer's body between her and the men. Taking advantage of her greater strength, Starla pulled the woman down so their arm lay across the column as if it were a sword on an anvil, then swung her hammer like a smith pounding steel. The archer's indelible scream would take an ocean of drink to be washed from Krog's memory. He watched from behind the wall where Starla had left him and admired her ability to read her enemies. She must have sensed a bond between the blonde and the archer, as her cruel act drove the sword-wielding man into a frenzy. His reckless charge blocked the spearman. Starla released the screaming woman's wrist, grabbed the longbow, and raised it to meet a great overhead swing from the swordsman. The bow was cleaved almost in two, but served its purpose. With a swing of her hammer, Starla turned his chest into a splintered cupboard of bone and blood. Krog slipped a dagger from his boot, then stalked toward the combatants. Doing so, he noticed every time the spearman tried to speak, Starla would take a swing with her hammer, even when it put her in a bad position. Krog's words about a spearhead getting cozy in Starla's guts nearly came true, but for the quality of her chainmail. The spearman lunged, trying to see if her skull was as hard as her shirt. Both warriors let out a surprised grunt when she seized his weapon right below the head. Starla brought her hammer down, breaking the shaft in two. Before the spearman could react, she swung back upward, driving the raven's beak under his jaw. Dropping her end of the broken spear, Starla used her palm to pound on the hammer's blunt end. 
The spearman gurgled and danced a terrible jig until she pierced brain with beak. How could you do this? The archer hadn't passed out from the pain of her shattered arm. Krog jerked to a stop. He kept one eye on Starla, saw her warrior's mask crumple. Tears began to run from her eyes as freely as blood from her foes. Gods damn you! Damn you, you made me do this, she shouted at the woman creature from the other village. How could you? Starla cut off the archer with two quick taps of steel upon skull. Then Starla gasped at the cold sliver slipping through blue cloak underneath black chain mail to score her speckled pale lower back. Krog's dagger. Yes, he said through a closed-lipped smile. How could you? How could I what? Lie to me. I've lied about nothing. The truth slipped out along with your tears. He pressed the dagger a little harder. Krog's head grew light, and a tingle ran up his spine. He heard Starla taking a deep swallow, fingers sinking harder into the leather grip of her hammer. His fingers felt like when you hit that one part of your elbow and... Krog's knife clattered upon the old floor. His hand shook too hard to hold it. Starla turned her big pale moon of a face to look at him. Why do I feel like I'm falling backward? he asked. Starla spotted something behind him and screamed. This was not like the sound she'd made charging into battle. Krog's own panic rose up, pushing past his lips. It's my blood! My blood is betraying me! He cried out, clasping onto her with both numb, tingling hands. Still staring past him, she began to peel back his fingers like a cruel parent denying their child refuge from a bully. Then he felt the same fierce jerk she presumably did, and they fell to the ground in a heap. Right away, the invisible hooks in their veins pulled them toward what made the fierce warrior scream, what Krog had been too afraid to look back at until his tumbling gave him no choice in the matter. All the blood she'd slopped across the old wheelhouse's floors had begun to move. As the life left her opponent's bodies, it snaked along stone to form tributaries for a swelling spiral in the dead center of the main chamber's floor. Whatever made this happen, it had to be what was dragging them toward that spiral. Slow at first, then much, much faster. Krog scrambled over the mountain of a woman. He didn't need to outrun this terror, he had to outrun her. She let out a short, sharp bark. He couldn't help himself. Krog looked back again. The spiral spun and stretched upward into a typhoon the size of an old tree. The three dead bodies were all drained now, the rivulets of gore having snapped off from the wounds Starla had inflicted. Now these streams were tendrils of the typhoon, two of them wrapped around Starla's leg like love-starved vipers. A third blood tendril snared Krog's neck, the two squeezing Starla's leg crept up her body. Each time either of them tried to rip away these unnatural limbs, their fingers passed through the blood like the liquid it was, yet its grip was as solid as the damnable island itself. Pulling first Starla, then Krog threw a shower of coppery warmth into the eye of the storm. Struggling to breathe, Krog forced his eyes open to see Starla held aloft, directly opposite. Beyond her, he could see nothing but the scarlet hurricane surrounding them. It filled their ears with a howling no mouth could make. Krog tried to yell at her, the big hero, to do something, but the tendril's grip on his throat was too tight. One of the tendrils squirmed like a maggot through the split in his bruised cheek. Despite the awful sensation, Krog was distracted when another began forcing its way into Starla's own wound. As a boy, Krog had seen the shirtless back of a man who'd survived a lightning strike. Livid fuchsia scars mapped out the veins from where the gods had entered him right through to where they'd left. All the rivers, streams, and inlets made clear. Something similar bloomed along Starla's forearm. Her veins swelled and burst with the overflow of possessed blood forcing its way inside. Then he yanked his head away from the pulsing liquid, working its way into his face, like a worm tunneling into a rotten apple. It hurt. It was killing him. Would he die before or after it reached his brain? Starla, eyes boring a hole through the air above his head, looked to be pondering again. What is she thinking about? She's some kind of legend in the making. She should act. Why doesn't she save us? My true name is Vo. She abandoned the strange accent, likely made up, which had slipped during battle and given Krog permission to betray her. 
Not Starla. My name is Vo, and I'm no wandering hero from faraway lands. I'm the daughter of a blacksmith and a dyer from the village. The other village on this awful rock. She shrieked as the tendrils reaching into each of their veins vibrated like a plucked guitar string. It was tempting for Krog to surrender to the pain. The drive to hear what she'd say next was stronger. My parents died a year back. They told me stories that made me want to travel the world like a hero of legend. The vortex kept whirling. The tendrils still held them both above the ground, still invaded their bodies. Yet, the terror had ceased to escalate, as if listening to st um, Vo's words. So, with my mother's steel and my father's dyed wool, I made this costume, then slipped away to sea. Were the tendrils slowing in their drive toward the very roots of his eyes? But this damnable magic wouldn't let me go past the horizon, so I followed a clue from one of the old stories, here, with you as my guide. The false accent, my nonsense name, a coin I minted with a gleam to obscure my lies, all were to keep you from hating me, as I was raised to hate you. Krog gasped as the tendril swiftly removed itself. His feet touched the floor of the old wheelhouse once more. You freed me? You freed me. Still held high, Vo looked at Krog expectedly. Krog steeled himself. This didn't come naturally to him. He spoke the true meaning of Almark, told of sheep clearing barriers to eat the fruit of a farmer's labor. That's only the literal meaning, thief. The man was calling me a thief because, though I nudge a few sheep around to look respectable, it's what I truly am. Vo gasped. A tendril removed itself from her veins, yet the vortex still spun, and Vo wasn't being set free, though she was better able to breathe. Share whatever you're holding back, she cried out. Wanting the benefit without any risk, Krog marble-mouthed something she'd be unlikely to hear. Louder, Vo yelled. I said, I thoughts of killing and robbing you even before your accent slipped in combat. It's why I agreed to lead you here, where nobody would see. The gore in the air dissipated into nothingness. The vortex's howl fell away, and Vo was freed. A feeling of paternal approval washed over Krog. It helped with the painful ache of his morning's bruises, and the pricklier stranger hurt lining his burst veins. The sun's light fell on the horizon more brightly than before, as if showing the way. The Vo thing stared at it. Did she also feel like a parent was gazing at her with love? How did you know telling the truth would free us? I didn't. I just wasn't ready to die under a false name, she said, then turned back to him with a deep frown on her face. I imagine we've passed some test. I'm sorry I thought to rob you. It's, it's been my nature so long. I promise I wouldn't now. Not now, the shepherd said. Honestly. That wasn't welcome news, but it isn't what's bothering me, Vo paused. The wizard was just a character in stories I was raised on. My village doesn't have any stories about wizards. Hmm. One story told how the southern kings chose to leave on this island two peoples from the mainland whose feuding had caused no end of grief, like removing misbehaving children from a feast. The great wizard had spun a spell to keep them close to the island, with barely enough leash to allow for fishing. Bo stared at the bloody mess in the wheelhouse. A magic prison hiding its key, here, the site of first landing. So, Krog said, we found the key, which I suppose was honesty and trust between people from either side of the old feud. So, Vo shouted, so the wizard trapped our peoples here for so long, the trap became a legend. Then an old story, a single pair of people from one village, my parents, remembered. So our peoples have bred and fought and become more and more narrow-minded, and even our words have begun to grow apart. I didn't know what an Almark, a Dottle, or a Bjerg was. The daughter of a blacksmith and a dyer paused, then rattled off several words, and asked if he knew them. Hearing the seventh, Browst, Krog shook his head. It means to brew crab apple cider. Nothing more. Bo shook her head. Something so simple. With enough time, we might not even be able to talk, assuming we could stop from killing each other first. All because some wizard thought his power gave him the right to chain us to this miserable place by our very blood. Krog shrank back as Vo covered her face with her hands. Uh, knowing wizards, he's found some way to live for centuries, she snarled. I'll kill him. 
I'm going to kill that wizard bastard. Good luck with all that. Krog began walking the way they would came, facing her way in case he caught a hammer in the back. Peering between her trembling fingers, Vo asked him, Where are you off to? Krog stopped in his tracks. Uh, a village where at least one man will try to kill me. All the rest would have me bound and thrown from the highest cliff for thieving as soon as they could prove my crimes. Sooner or later, someone will, he told her. Then a realization sent his mouth moving again. Wait a minute! You must have known those raiders, and you still killed them! Bo leaned her head back to face the sky as if trying to keep fresh tears at bay. In our village, the penalty for speaking with people from your village is death. They say it's the only way to seal off contamination from your lies. She swallowed hard, then looked the shepherd right in the eyes. It's why I have no intention of trying to free the others. It took a miracle for us to survive this trial. Can you really see us convincing several hundred more to duplicate it? Krog shook his head once more. We both chose to reveal our true selves, to trust the other. Now we have to temper and oil that trust if we're going to leave this island together. Krog couldn't help pointing at himself to clarify she meant him. No, the other thieving shepherd I've just gone through hell with. Listen, I've got a boat moored not far from where we met, she told him, holding out the promise of a new life if they could outgrow the cradle of prejudice in their heads, as they had found a way out from the magic which had trapped their peoples for generations. My, my name is Krog, he walked over to her, extending his hand, and I'd like to leave this island with you. She glared into his eyes for one long moment, then gave his hand a short shake. Krog, I know that word, to seek shelter from the weather under an overhang with your animals, she said. Hang on, what about your sheep? They can get their own damn boat. Long after the sun had set, Vo kept her sturdy shoulders moving. She'd sworn not to stop rowing until the island vanished over the horizon behind them. Leaning into a cool breeze, Krog saw just that. It's happening, he yawned. Vo locked the oars and turned around to see for herself, to see the world vanish. Maybe now we can finally get a little sleep, he said. Do you still hate me for being from the other village? she asked him. I don't know, do you hate me for where I'm from? Vo shrugged uncertainly. The waves lapped at their boat. Already it was clear the current would take them wildly off course if someone wasn't always rowing. Who should be the first to sleep? Vo asked. Surely it's you, he replied. You've been rowing for hours. They'd been moving south, where they knew land was waiting. Now the boat's nose had dipped and swung almost all the way, facing east, about which they knew nothing. My mother taught me endurance enough to hammer an anvil all through the night. I imagine you took many a nap while minding sheep. Why not sleep now? Yes, I sometimes napped. It was so I could be alert when sneaking into my neighbor's fields under moonlight. Krog waited for further discussion. Lips sealed, Vo leaned back and crossed her arms. So he did the same, squinting through his still bruised lids. From either end of the boat, they watched each other. And watched and bobbed along with the current, and Krog wondered if a lifetime of hatred could be dispelled like magic. Those fingers spread apart, allowing Krog to look up at next morning's sun stabbing through the ocean's surface, several inches above his head. Off-white medallions wobbled up from his mouth. Vo seemed to be counting them, ignoring Krog's fingernails as he dug into her unfairly hard bicep. With the same hand she'd used to pull him up from the grass the day before, she pulled his face level with the brine. A wave splashing my face, waking me before you could cut my throat. That's why I'm alive and you're underwater. Pure chance it didn't go the other way, which tells you how much the gods care. The night before, Krog had been surprised to discover that when he actually had a future far away from the island, it did matter to him if he lived or died. That was why he decided to stretch the food supplies by killing Vo. When I shared my true self with you, I meant it. You just said whatever you needed to, and were released from that hellish, half-baked morality puzzle all the same. 
That shows how much the wizard truly cared. Krog sputtered and choked. You have to put the work in if you want the rewards of growing as a person. That's what I reminded myself while watching one screaming sheep shuffler raise a rock over the other. That to get off the island, I had to move past my desire to see you die. Bo stared at him, not hiding behind closed eyes like when he thought about what to say next. Yet people who act in bad faith can't be tolerated, no matter which village they're from. A small wave washed over Krog, salty water drowning his reply. Once again, the giantess pulled Krog up so quickly it made him dizzy, only this time she used both hands to hold him high over her head. Of course, this too could only be so much air I'm pushing past my teeth, Bo steadied herself. Let me show you how much I care. Sailing over the water, in the direction of their home island, Krog remembered hearing about the other village's barbaric stone-heaving competitions. His impact with the ocean smacked those thoughts clear out of his head. After struggling back to the surface, Krog was stunned by how quickly Vo had set to rowing away from him. Swim, shepherd, swim! No fisherman from the island will want to pick you up, but, she called out, maybe your sheep will have gotten their own damn boat. The End Alright, while reading, I found zero typos and only one missing word, so that's nice. <laughs> I don't mind letting you know that that is the third version of the ending. The first was the thing I described back in the pilot episode of this podcast, where it just kind of, you know, ended with like a, hey, do you think we can get over our hatred of each other for reals after having to sort of kind of fake it for that ill-thought-out morality puzzle? Who knows? Fade to black, you know, or panda stars with fade to black, whatever, that kind of thing. After the story editor, who looked at my sixth draft, correctly pointed out that ending didn't really say anything, it wasn't terribly definitive, I then made up my mind to add the bit about them on the boat the next morning with the sun rising and all that stuff. I very quickly in my mind saw Vo <laughs> holding Krog under the water, and I thought, you know what, let's just have her make some really explicit statements about the theme and stuff, which always feels a bit cringy when I write those kinds of lines, but then I have to remind myself of just how many times I've been reading a book that I really love, uh, or re-watching a movie or TV show that I really love, and a character will almost literally be like, I have these feelings, and the theme is this. This is the conclusion of the story, both in plot and argument. Goodbye! <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, I'll be like, oh, right, yeah, I guess they did that. And as a viewer or reader, I was fine with it. So maybe I should be fine with doing that sometimes in my stories, being a little just clear and direct about the stuff that's really important. I also took the opportunity to highlight and underline something that's very important to me about the story. And it's only more important now that the story is a launching pad for the whole short story cycle novel thing, ending with the confrontation with the wizard, which is that the magical morality thing was not very well thought out. I'm always kind of scratching my head when I see that kind of gateway or puzzle or whatever magical phenomena in a story. My definitive statement about bad faith felt appropriate to the story, given that Krog is acting in bad faith basically the entire time. And while I do think it is important in life that we try to get over the urge to just, you know, smack or imprison or kill people who we don't care for, a slavish, unthinking devotion to being the bigger person can leave you vulnerable to bad faith actors, something I feel like I've been watching happen over and over and over in the political realm, certainly, my entire adult life. There have to be consequences, meaningful consequences, for bad faith actors, otherwise they will just run roughshod over everyone else. So, in a dark mirroring of the beginning, where, or I guess about five minutes before the beginning, kind of, where Vo had to get over the hatred she'd been taught, the desire to just kill Krog or let both shepherds kill each other or whatever, in order to get on with her life, to get further, to get where she wants to go, which is the ruins and ultimately off the island, I had her kill Krog because that's what she had to do, it felt like, in order to keep going, to not have her throat slit while she's sleeping, to be able to get to the mainland. But after a while and a couple more drafts, I just found myself thinking, you know, this is A, darker than I think I want this story to be, and this character, really. B, 
I feel like I've done this before. And I have, in my first novel, Junkyard Leopard, where the character of the figure brings murderous consequences to all kinds of bad faith actors in the financial sector. If I'm going to become a better writer, then certainly I need to stop going back to the same wells, or at least try not to. And if I'm going to become a better person, which I'd like to keep working on my whole life if I can, then I need to move past my knee-jerk reaction of just, you know, F them uh, to various groups and characters in the world who frustrate me with their bad faith actions. And so that brings us to the third ending, the one that I just read you, where, I mean, Krog is probably going to die. <laughs> He's probably still gonna die, but he at least has a chance to swim back to the island, and Vo has at least given him that, ch that chance, even though it's the kind of chance of saying, well, you made your bed, now here you go lie in it, as opposed to, I am going to end you, and your corpse will lay in this bed. <laughs> I think there is a difference there. Certainly there's a difference in tone, it feels a lot more sort of jocular and like da-da-da-da-da-da, off to adventure. And that's what I want. I want it to feel sort of a little more upbeat, a little more hopeful, but also satisfying, I hope. It certainly makes a clearer statement than the first ending. Eh, what do you guys think? You know, holler at me on Twitter at so underscore writing. Or if you're on the Patreon, patreon.com slash so I'm writing a novel, comment underneath the blog post for this episode. Otherwise, well, I did find it a bit rough reading the word blood what felt like a hundred times, but I guess if you put a blood vortex in a story... <laughs> That's gonna happen. Just gotta accept it. I also found that there were certain lines which still really give me joy. The craw getting the gist of having a shoulder crush in a vice bit. The my scepter response at the beginning. The splintered cupboard of blood and bone. That's satisfying. And of course, they can get their own damn boat. I really like that line. <laughs> Probably why, you know, I used it to build the uh, new ending. Overall, I still like the story. After 10 drafts, I should hope so. But I do wince a little. Not at the tenth draft, per se, but at my memory of how I rushed the outlining of the story, which brings me to what I think in my writing and perhaps my life, <laughs> my life uh, is my greatest strength slash weakness, which is my impatience. On the one hand, I used about half of a skinny notebook uh, for this project. Uh, the date on the first page of notes is May 30th, 2019 and the date of my list of second draft editing notes checklist is September 28th, 2019. So I guess I spent about three, three and a half months between first ideas and a first draft, which is not, you know, is that bad? I don't know. But the thing is, that was three and a half months where I was mostly working on other stuff. This was kind of in the margins. And also there's linear time, but there's also how much I see on the page here. And what I see on the page, well, I see about 15 pages of pretty loosey-goosey notes, which, you know, they always start off loosey-goosey because you're just brainstorming, getting stuff down, whatever. But over and over, I see myself starting things like, you know, what is Vo's, uh, I don't know, religion? What's her deal there? And I just wrote the header and then went, eh, and kept moving. Over and over, I see myself, you know, working out just barely enough of this aspect or another aspect in order to feel confident going forward. But I wonder if I couldn't have spent some more time on some of that stuff so that maybe now the story wouldn't have this feeling of like, I don't know. It's like um, I wrote my first novel almost just to see if I could write a novel. It was really powered by a lot of impetuousness and just like going for it energy. And even though I have a big binder somewhere with piles of eight and a half by 11, you know, lined paper with notes and stuff all over it. There was this feeling of just like running while I was doing it. And I took my time more with my second novel, but there was still this feeling of just like writing a feeling of I gotta tell this story, I gotta get it out, ah! And that's the feeling I see at the heart of this short story. And it's a feeling that to me seems kind of impatient. It's good, it's a strength in the sense that it can help me just do things that maybe Otherwise, I would have convinced myself not to do or taken so long to do that I would have lost my enthusiasm for it. But of course, that same impatience may have made me move past the outlining stage before I should have, so the story wasn't as well thought out as it could be. And by the time you get to several drafts deep, it's so much more work to kind of reverse engineer new outlining material for the thing. To mess with the skeleton of the thing after you've already put organs and muscle and skin over all of that. And I feel like I have concrete evidence of that on one page of this notebook where I actually, before I decided I was going to do this thing as a novel in early 2020, in late 2019, I sent it out to a few 
magazines. This was the fifth draft before the story editors saw it, and when I was still telling it from both Vo and Krog's perspectives, cutting back and forth, cutting back and forth kind of way too rapidly for sure in the uh, fifth draft, I slowed it down a bit for the sixth draft, switching back and forth, uh, the sixth draft, the one that went to the story editor, and ultimately decided to just make it the perspective of Krog, which, by the way, is what was suggested to me by my girlfriend before I sent it out to those places in December of 2019, those places which ultimately rejected it. Now, they may have rejected it anyway, but A, maybe I should have listened to her, and B, maybe I could have spent more time on the outlining and the thing at the very beginning, and that would have resulted in a stronger story by the time I got to a fifth draft. So, yeah, I'm wary of my impatience, and I'm trying very hard to put a saddle on that sucker for this novel. Doesn't mean I want to go the other way and spend like 10 years on the outlining and never really write the book. I am determined to write this thing and finish this thing in a reasonable period of time. I just want to pull back the throttle a little bit to see if I can find that sweet spot between being driven forward to act and do the thing, but not being impatient and rushing the thing so that it's a you know weaker thing than it would have been otherwise. Thing. I'm a writer. I know words. I would say that's one of three big challenges that rereading this story has helped remind me of in terms of what I'm going to face going forward with the novel, harnessing my impatience. The second is learning my prose voice, because honestly, until now, I have mostly written in yeah, my voice. It's my voice, whatever. I've always been told I have a very distinctive voice, by which I mean, by the way, not what you're hearing in your ears right now, but just like if you read my writing, you know, has a distinct like, ah, this is Oliver. OK, I can tell kind of thing going on, which is great. I mean, a lot of people struggle with finding their voice. It seems I've been lucky with that. What I need to do, though, is better understand it and think about it a little more, actually understand the guts of it. What is it that makes something sound like me so that I can maybe lean into that and make my style more, you know, have pop even more. And at points when I'm writing certain characters, POVs, like, you know, other people in Krog who are going to be looking at her and describing her to you, well, I don't want them all to sound like me, do I? <laughs> Finally, the third sort of big challenge I see and I'm reminded of by rereading this story to you is learning to think more precisely about my prose. You know, for years now, I have mostly been writing screenplays, which have trained me to kind of just not worry too much about how precise my prose is. I've no doubt there are many screenwriters who would argue with me, but as I've come to understand it, you want to make it sound exciting, right, in your screenplay, and you want to write in a way that represents the kind of story, the tone. Of course, you do think about your prose, so to speak, in the screenplay, but at the end of the day, you're writing a blueprint. And so many other people are going to collaborate to create the characters and the setting and all that stuff. And when you're trying to sell a thing, you just want to make it sound exciting, like you're leaning across the table and telling someone a really badass story, right? Or a really funny story or whatever kind of story it is. And ultimately, I don't think an executive has ever rejected a TV pilot or a feature film because they're like, oh, well, the prose was a bit pedestrian. I mean, if it, you know, if it sucked and they didn't, you know, that contributed to them not enjoying the story, then sure. But however exactly your sentences are constructed, your script will be rejected because of them not liking the story, or maybe it doesn't fit their slate of projects for the coming period, or maybe they really love it, but they don't want to pick up a fantasy series right now, because who wants to compete with Apple's $18 billion budget Lord of the Rings adaptation? Ugh, right? So <laughs> it's just not as high a priority as it is with a book where you are the only person showing them the story. There are no actors set designers, etc., right? So for this book, I really want to think a lot harder about sentence construction than when I'm just kind of writing that I gotta do this thing feeling that I described a moment ago, that feeling that drove this short story. That challenge excites and intrigues me, but it also reminds me of how in English class in high school and middle school, I loved English class, particularly the creative writing, as you can imagine, and I hated grammar. I don't know, it just kind of tweaked the part of my brain that was bad at math. By the way, I was bad at math. And I still space for a second. If someone asks me what a gerund or a participle is, you know, ancient grammar test anxiety scattering my brain cells like a really good break at the pool table. <laughs> I'll remember eventually, but I'm going to have a rough moment and you might watch my eyes slowly move to point in different directions. <laughs>
Speaking of language and use of it, I think next time I'll probably pause to talk about language and race in my novel and fantasy novels in general. Now, that could mean, you know, the kind of language usage I was just talking about, but also, of course, like the conventions of various languages being present in a fantasy or sci-fi story and how we get around the fact that the character may have to know a lot of languages in order to be able to talk to everybody. And then you've got the other thing that comes up a lot in fantasy and science fiction, the you know, the word race being used almost like I feel like you should use uh, the word species instead. But yeah, this kind of very Dungeons and Dragonsy thing of like the race of orcs, the race of dwarves, the race of elves, the race of man. And then there's the issues around race, which are a little more, you know, what we're familiar with from our day to day lives, which also it's a thing to think about when you're writing fantasy and sword and sorcery and really anything at all, I suppose. But it's definitely worth addressing here. So, yeah, that'll be next time. Now, time for a listener question, which, by the way, I've had a couple of people say to me, oh, well, here's my question. I hope it's OK that I gave you a question because I don't really have any experience writing. Let me stress Anybody can send a question. It's super cool. Remember, this is supposed to be a very inclusive project. It's fine if you don't have any experience writing whatsoever. That's probably part of why you have a question. Hit me up with your questions, folks. All right, time for this episode's listener question. Coming from Christina in Ottawa, Canada, the question is this. How does one close in on one particular idea enough to take the plunge on writing that particular book? This is something I'm struggling with myself. Too many possibilities, and I can't seem to decide and be certain about any one of them. Thank you for the question, Christina. Well, in my experience, it can be one or more of the following. The first thing that comes to mind is if you just keep feeling it, you know, it just keeps feeling like this is a good idea. This is something I should do. This is something I want to do. If that feeling keeps returning to you, even when you're just like having breakfast or doing something else unrelated to writing, that's a good sign you might want to do this book. Another is if it becomes kind of a hobby, by which I mean, you know, maybe it starts off as you reading a lot of sword and sorcery books. And then you're like, man, I want to know more about this genre. I'm going to really study it. So you read even more and you make a point of finding out who inspired who and working your way back through a chain of authors in the genre that you want to write, for example. Or maybe you wind up reading lots of nonfiction books related to the geographic region where your story would hypothetically be set, that kind of thing. Alternately, there might be a truly compelling image that stays with you. It could be an image you find like me with Norman Rockwell's Rosie the Riveter, which kept making me think of, you know, I want to see her as a protagonist. I want to see her as a protagonist. Or maybe it's something that just comes to mind, burbling up from your subconscious, and that just keeps returning to you. If you have that kind of strong feeling coming from the inside out, that's also a really good sign. Now, I guess I've just given you two more variations on if you keep feeling it to other manifestations, but I, I think that's the thing. Is do you keep feeling it, you know, and does your desire stay with you over time? You know, I think about a friend of mine, I'm sure other people have done this too, but a friend of mine years ago, we were talking about, do you want to get a tattoo? I don't know. Do you want to get a tattoo? And then he said, well, my brother has a way of figuring this out. He said, my brother, he'll figure out a design that he wants for a tattoo, draw it on a piece of paper or whatever, then fold up the piece of paper, put it in his drawer and not touch it for a year. If a year later he looks at that ta drawing and he still really likes it that much, still feels as strongly or more so, then he gets the tattoo. Otherwise, it wasn't meant to be. I think if you're having trouble figuring out which idea that you feel the strongest about, which one has you know, become a hobby or has a compelling image that stays with you or just straight up gives you a feeling you've got to follow, if that's kind of hard to juggle between two or more options, then maybe the drawer test would be a way to do it. It doesn't have to be a year, but at least a month of just trying really hard not to think about these things. And of course, if you can't stop thinking about one of them, well, then that's another indication. Something a little more proactive that I would recommend, something that has helped me on the few occasions. I've been lucky. I tend to know what I want to write, but sometimes I'm unsure. And when I've been unsure, I find the thing to do is to just do a little bit of work on each idea. And if I'm doing a little bit of work on something and like one thing I write down makes me think of another thing, makes me think of 10 more things. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, OK, then that helps clarify my feelings. If that happens with one idea and another idea, eh, you know, I, I kind of noodle with it for 10 minutes and it doesn't get me too far. 
So sometimes, yeah, you just got to try, you know, do a little work on each idea and then see which one sparks the most further work, i.e. inspiration, ideas, etc. The final thing I'll say to this is, well, you know, there's a pretty stock piece of writing advice that I have butt my head against a few times, which is don't chase trends. Just write what you want to write. If you chase trends, by the time you get your manuscript done, ready to submit to places, people won't want to get that kind of story anymore. And your passion for it won't be as strong because you're just trying to hit a target. You're not trying to tell your story. So, okay, sounds good, right? But then you also have people say, well, study the market. You know, if you're serious about making a living at this, I mean, you might want to tell your story, but if your story is so niche, so specific, then uh, people won't want to buy that. Now, you can tell as my voice became more mocking that I also don't like that advice. <laughs> I mean, if I had to choose one, I would say don't chase trends is the better one for sure, especially given that the financial margins, as far as I can see in the world of writing novels and short stories in particular, are so slim. Like, you know, next to nobody makes a living at it, which is a shame, and that's a whole nother rant. But uh, yeah, if so given that's the case, I would say definitely you should write what you want to write the most, you know, and worry less about how much money you're going to make from it. Over in the world of screenwriting, which I'm currently a bit more familiar with, there's much more chance. It's not easy, don't get me wrong, but it's more likely that you can make a living in that field of writing. And so, yeah, also you're more dependent on like a larger family of people to sell something and get it made. Uh, I've definitely heard people who've been told, you know, yeah, write just what you want to write, man. Go as specific as you want. And then they take it to an independent producer, production company, agent, manager, whatever, and that person will just be like, yeah, I can't sell a TV show about a new necrophiliac who brushes his teeth 30 times a day every day it's kind of niche <laughs> don't steal my idea about that toothbrushing necrophiliac <laughs> But yeah, something that I find very frustrating as someone who is keeping an eye on writing advice as I want to become a better writer is that a lot of advice, including this kind of study the market versus don't chase trends thing, the, the answer is like a moving target that sits somewhere in between two extremes on a spectrum. So you really just have to kind of follow your gut on that one, which I guess comes back to my advice uh, for how else to choose the book, which it all comes down to feeling and finding ways to clarify your feelings if they are a bit muddy. All right, well, I hope that helped. Good luck choosing the idea you want to go forward with for your book, and if things happen with it, please let me know. I'd love to hear all about it. So I'm Writing a Novel features original music by Gloria Guns and is hosted by yours truly, Oliver Brackenbury. If you'd like to submit a question, then please email it to so I'm writing a novel at gmail.com. Bonus points if you record yourself and send me an mp3 I can cut into the show. Doesn't have to be fancy. Using your phone is fine, just keep it clear and concise. You can also holler at the show on Twitter. Look for at so underscore writing. Please consider sharing the show with anybody who might like it, leaving a review on iTunes, and checking out patreon.com slash so I'm writing a novel. Patrons get to be thanked in the final novel, listen to episodes of the podcast a week early, and even enjoy a bonus podcast called So I Wrote a Novel, where I read and comment on chapters of previous works, starting with my first novel, Junkyard Leopard. Thanks for hanging out with me, and I'll see you soon.